Hello, everyone. I'm Larry Vincent. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about brands. I'm the Chief Branding Officer at United Talent Agency and uh, have spent my entire career working with brands all over the world in helping them connect with audiences. And what I got planned for you today is about, I'm going to take you through some material for about uh, 30 minutes or so, and then we'll stop. And I'd love to open it up to questions. I, um, this is the stuff that uh, is always the most interesting part of the session for me. So hopefully we'll get through it. Um, I've been told sometimes my presentations are a bit of a fire hose. So get ready. You're in the splash zone. Um, we're going to go through a lot of material. Um, what I want to start with today, actually, is kind of one of the most fundamental questions. And I know for a lot of you, you're already pretty familiar with brands. So this may seem remedial. Um, and yet it's a question that a lot of times when I work with clients, and, and I'm talking about big corporations as well as, as celebrities and talent, sometimes we have to argue about what exactly it is that we're branding. That becomes a really important piece. And if you think about it, brand, I often talk about brands being pronounized. Um, we kind of talk about it as though it's anything. Um, and in some ways, that is the world we live in today. Brands can be companies, they can be products, they can be services. If you go to a Westin hotel for at least before lockdown, you were told you were breathing Westin air. So we've taken the most abundant natural resource and found a way to put a brand on it. And so it's always good for us to, to start at a, at a common definition uh, of what a brand is. And so I'm gonna turn it over to you. Let's start first by just asking you, I've got three options here on the screen, but what is in your mind, the most important aspect of a brand? Um, some of you may have heard of the term positioning before. We think about a name and logo, or you can tell me whether it's something else. Um, but this is always an interesting piece. I've, I ask this question in a lot of the uh, talks that I give, and, and we get uh, always get different results. Um, so I'm going to give just a minute more for us to, to get these in, and then I'm going to move in uh, and, and show you the results. Um, I think we are, are we up and running? Great. So. Uh, I can't see what you voted for, so I have to take. I have to assume that uh, it's one of the three, and we'll we'll go from there. But I'm going to tell you a little bit that all three of those those choices are are actually equally correct. But where we want to go from here right now is to sort of think about how we want to talk about it today. And I'm going to start here, which I know for those of you that are vegan, it probably seems like a really cruel slide, and I apologize. Um, but we have to go back. Uh, to the most fundamental roots in thinking about the cattle trade of the 19th century, which their branding had a really clear meaning. It was inventory control. You know, at the end of the day, you wanted to make sure that you got your cows back from the range and, and your neighbor didn't take some of them with him. And so we, we actually put these physical brands on animals to be able to sort them out. And that idea and that concept has carried through with us into grocers and department stores, where we start knowing who the different makers are by the brand. Now, the reason why I often show this slide, though, is because the, the earliest uh, indications of where brands would be today started during that, that heyday of um, the, um, the uh, cattle trades. Because what would happen is you'd have certain ranches that would take their cows to, to market, to auction. And, you know, it's a commodity. You, you basically bid on cattle based on what you see. And you can tell if it's a healthy cow or not and how much money should you be willing to pay for that. But the reality is we were starting to see some, uh, some brands that were bringing their cows to market that were fetching a price above the commodity rate or the premium. And it wasn't because of the mistake that I think a lot of people make today in the 21st century where we think about, well, that's got a really cool logo. I know a lot of you said name and logo was the most important part of a brand. But what was happening here is if you looked at, for instance, the King Ranch in Texas back in the early days, um, their logo wasn't particularly interesting. It was a running W. It was a snake that sort of formed itself into a W. But that's not why people were willing to pay more for their cattle versus others. They were willing to pay more for the, for the King Ranch's uh, cattle because they knew it was a very different hereditary stock. It had been imported from the UK. Um, they believed that you should bring your cattle overland rather than putting them on rail cars because it kept them more healthy. And all of those factors contributed to why they were one, they would fetch a premium price while their, their neighbors at auction didn't. And that's one of the things that I want you to think of right at the beginning of this, is the importance of what the logo signifies, not necessarily how cool the note logo is. Um, around the studio where I work, we have these conversations that um, really they could be put into Silicon Valley, the television show, because they sound so ridiculous at times. Um, but they're really important. And, and the biggest one we often say is, where's the idea? That a brand is ultimately an idea. And, and functionally, when we look at the data science, um, we know that it becomes this device that helps us mem remember companies or people or whatever it is we're branding. We know that it gets attached to emotions. We will see people uh, react differently, even just from hearing a brand name. There was a landmark study 
uh, a couple about a, uh, 10 years ago uh, that was in the Journal of Consumer Research where they actually put consumers into functional MRI tubes and they were watching their brainwave patterns as they were shown or set, read to different brand names. And we could see brands like Apple would actually light up certain emotional centers of the brain without any other kind of exposure other than just hearing the brand name or seeing the logo. And the last part of it is also, as, as we all know, is that brands are here to cue us to make a decision. It could be a purchase, it could be a vote, it could be something as simple as getting you to do something with your health, as we've seen in really successful public service campaigns. But the brand becomes this trigger that helps to move you over and to make a decision. And there's, this is where I think most brands get into trouble. Um, and usually when I get called in to help fix a brand, this is the, the area we roll up our sleeves and we're trying to figure out what's going on here. Why, are, why aren't people making the decisions that we want them to? What's the brand problem? And it usually hinges on this sort of connection between truth and possibility. I can't say this enough. Uh, in fact, this was something that I observed in my work so much as the reason I wrote my last book, Brand Real, is that I was finding people that would come and talk to me and they wanted a new fancy brand, but they weren't willing to change the fundamentals of what that brand delivered. So there was no truth. It was all possibility. Uh, it was all things that they wished they were. And we all, anyone who has been on a search for a romantic partner knows there's a big difference about what someone tells you that they will be like as, as, your, as your date than what they really turn out to be often. We want that connection between truth and possibility. Without truth, you have no brand. But I can also say without possibility, you may have a boring brand. So what we're trying to do is to balance these two things. And it might help to just give you an example. If we think about Starbucks, there's a lot of things that come to mind, but I often will go out and I'll poll people and say, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word Starbucks? And nine times out of 10, people will say coffee, right? Coffee. But that is the fundamental truth. When, when uh, the leadership came back to Starbucks after a little bit of a break and they'd gotten into entertainment, they'd gotten into a lot of subsidiary businesses, the number one thing that they talked about doing was getting back to having good coffee. Because if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have a brand. But of course, Starbucks is so much more than that. If we know from their history that they've always talked about being the third place. And that third place, of course, is your local Starbucks that you might stop in between wherever you're going and, and your home. But it also is a figurative idea. We actually can, if I ask consumers to imagine a Starbucks hotel, it's very easy for them to start talking about the kinds of furnishings that it would have, the kinds of food that it would serve, the kind of music that would be playing in the background. So that's what we talk about when we're talking about possibility. The brand has to be true to what it's about. But it also, if it's really a great brand, it evokes this sense of possibility. It takes me to another place. Now, I'm going to set up the most basic equation, um, and all of us can, can do this kind of math. It's really easy. We learned it in grade school. When we talk about the value of a brand, we are talking about the balance of two things. And the first of those is really thinking about the expectation that that brand sets. And this is the area that the strategists in the room and the people who've worked in advertising, the people who've worked a lot in marketing are very familiar with. Like We, we start thinking about the words that we want to use to establish the brand. That's setting up the expectation. There's a lot of words that are used uh, to describe that. I want you to think today about a promise, that a brand is a promise. And ultimately, what you are saying when you are thinking about your brand and you're setting that expectation is that you're going to actually deliver on whatever it is uh, that you are promising to, to your customers or to your audiences. And this is a really important piece because we're always thinking about, you know, your goal to create brand value is to meet or exceed that expectation through your experiences. If you do that, you're doing great. If you're not living up to expectations, then you have a reputation problem. So having that idea of what a promise is, is the most important piece for us in terms of planning for a brand and getting people aligned in our organization to deliver that, right, that great brand experience that people write about and talk about and badge with honor uh, amongst their friends. And there's all kinds of different ways to think about these brand promises. Um, this is what you're seeing here is a spectrum of them. And we've found this in our research I'm a researcher by training. I spend a lot of time in the field talking to consumers, um, doing quantitative research. There's, we, we have a number of ways that we're always out there. But one of the things we're looking at is what are the types of promises that people perceive from brands? And it kind of runs in a spectrum. On the left-hand side, what you're seeing is a little more functional, a little, a little lower level in terms of it's just a basic need. Um, uh, two of the logos are uh, graying out on my screen. I'm not quite sure if they are on yours, but let me tell you what they are. The first is Amazon on the left. And Amazon's all about access, right? It's, you know it'll get delivered to your door. It has everything that you could want. It has become a brand that consistently wins when we do brand rankings as the top brand in the world that people say that they, they favor the most. And one of the reasons for that is the feelings that they get from that unfettered access. Um, 
that now sometimes when people hear that they think that's very boring it can be emotional the people the, the the joy that amazon has actually created for people sometimes by exceeding uh, expectations telling you your package is going to arrive on thursday and then you get it on tuesday and people just feel great about that because it happens so infrequently so there's emotions attached to that there's security there's confidence so there can be emotional even though this feels more functional on the left on the other side is the right where we get into lifestyle and here we're not talking specifically about something as simple as access. We're now talking about a narrative world, a story that you're being invited into. I, a lot of times when I would show this side of the spectrum, I'd talk about Ralph Lauren because he actually thought about his brand in the very early days as a movie. He wanted people to feel like they were stepping into a movie that was very preppy or in the case of denim was very much tied to the, the movie Giant and that feeling of being on the great American range. Um, I like Lululemon here because Lululemon, although it has many functional attributes and Lululemon has, it certainly has a personality, it also is evoking a lifestyle of wellness. And they spend a lot of time finding influencers and people to work with them just to, to sustain that lifestyle that people aspire to and want to wear even when they're not working out and, and exercising. It's become now a casual wear, especially during COVID. And in between, we have all sorts of other dimensions, functions and features. Uh, I've showed Quip here. If you're looking at a promise that's dealing with functions and features, my advice to you is to try to keep it to as few as possible. The best brands that use these kinds of promises sometimes only stick to one. Uh, I, in, the same, in the same oral hygiene category, Crest from its outset has always talked about better uh, oral hygiene. They've talked about being the brand that nine out of 10 dentists recommend. And they always came back to that, even when they would combine it like for a fresh breath uh, uh, um, promise, they would bring another one of the Procter & Gamble's brands to the table. They'd bring scope in. So now you were getting the, the cavity fighting power of Crest, but you were also getting the fresh breath of scope. And so these, these work best when they're really in those sort of singular areas. Approach, you can tell from the silhouette, is Apple. And of course, in the, from the very beginning, Steve Jobs has told us to think different. Um, their approach to doing things is never the way others do it. They set their own tone. So that way of, it's not so much about what I deliver, but it's actually how you deliver it. My favorite part of this, which some of you will remember, is when Steve Jobs was still alive and one of the iPhone models was starting to have antenna issues, they actually told you that we were holding the phone wrong and encouraged you to hold it in a different way. Again, approach became sort of the value add of Apple. It was, it, even though the products have great features, and of course there was definitely an Apple lifestyle, it seems to be that mantra which makes it work. And in between we have personality. So Goop has all you know, emanated first from the personality of Gwyneth Paltrow, but has also become a culture of its own where it's really about sort of the way people think and, and whether or not you belong to it and what are those shared values that drive that promise. And then I put the honest company in here for cause. Causes don't always have to be nonprofit, although a lot of nonprofit brands do fit into that cause promise. But what it really is, is you can do this for any brand when you start thinking about something that goes beyond you, your brand or your company, and you start thinking about something that's higher, it's nobler, it has a sense of purpose, it's got a sense of mission. In the honest company's case, it was really about making sure the best health for your family using the cleanest environments and things that are good for the environment and good for your family. And that actually allowed them to enter a category that no one thought was possible. And it was all because of how it resonated as a cause. Um, even though, again, we'll find traces of a function and a feature or an approach. So that spectrum is ways to think about it. There's many degrees in between. It's not like you have to pick one and stick with one. Um, in fact, some brands have moved over time from one area of a promise to another. Dove uh, soap started off very much in the features and functions category by being three quarters more moisturizing cream. And now is definitely in that cause area where it's really about more women and, and men feeling better about their bodies and feeling beautiful, whatever their skin type is. So again, you are, you're not locked into this. It can change over time, but you should have a good sense of what it means and what you want to convey with your promise. Now to do that, this is the hardest conversation that I have with CEOs often you have to make tough choices. And this becomes, the bigger your company gets, I think the harder this becomes to do because our instinct is we want to satisfy, we wanna check so many boxes. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. When we do brand health research, we will pick a number of attributes that we think are competitive in a category. And then we'll go out and we'll survey consumers and we ask them, first of all, to tell us how important these attributes are. And then they'll rank different brands and they'll rate them based on how they perform on those attributes. So you've all seen something like this probably before. You can imagine here, I'm, this is a fictional brand where our five attributes we may decide are usability, price, service, design, and the add-ons that are available for it. And you'd go out and you survey for your brand and you find a scores like this on a, on a scale of one to five. And you can see our fictional brand here is killing it on usability. It's just the easiest to use. 
people just naturally, they want to go with it because they don't have to do, spend a lot of time figuring out. And it's doing pretty well on design too. It seems to be something that also looks good and people like having it. Now it's not performing so well on price or service. Maybe it, it may be even in its category at the bottom of the, rail, of the bail, barrel there. And what I see again and again is I'll show these results to the management team. And there's immediately a conversation that breaks out. Sometimes I haven't even finished the presentation and the conversation has started of like, okay, what can we do on price? We need to maybe do a discount program or let's think about a buyback and a promotional offer or you know what? We got to rethink our whole service model because we're performing so poorly here. And that's not always the right answer, right? It seems like that's where we should go, but nothing comes free. There is no free lunch. And what happens when companies make these kinds of decisions where they suddenly shift their focus and ignore the fact that they're killing it on usability is they invest, they, they give up some of their margin by lowering their price. They invest in better service models. Maybe they hire more customer service representatives that costs money. And when we run the survey again, this is what the results look like. And these are awful. You win at nothing at this point, right? Now you are perfectly equal in all categories and you're absolutely a three, which is mediocre. So this is the, this works for people too. Like if you're an influencer and you're out there and you're trying to build your brand, you might find that like there's something about your personality or your material you're doing that people don't like and you want to adjust it. And in all the effort and energy you put into that area, you start to lose the specialness that made you great in the first place. And so what I tell brands is that you've got to stop thinking about how you're losing these, making these deficits by making these choices. When you were winning, you had a great category. The, the better way to do it is to expand your edge, right? And think about what is it I could do so that I can continue to own that trait, but just make my brand that much stronger and continue to make sure that it's differentiated enough from competitors that others aren't entrenching in my space. And the way that we often do that is thinking about adjacent categories that make sense. In, in our hypothetical brand here, we might decide, hey, we're doing pretty well in design and design and usability go hand in hand. So let's, let's take design to another level. Let's start leading in the category in design, holding on usability, bringing our usability uh, engineers together with our uh, industrial engineers who are doing the design. Let's make it even uh, an even better product. And it may cost us. We may even start to go down in our ratings for price. We may even lose some ratings and add-ons, but that's okay. We'll let the competitors do those because our analysis perhaps in this case has told us that these are areas that no competitor comes close and we can start to actually broaden our market. Now I'm oversimplifying this. Sometimes there's a lot of other factors. This, these may not be winning uh, uh, attributes. You might find that even though you rate very very well on these attributes in terms of relative importance to the customer, they're very low, in which case you might, you may want to rethink your whole proposition and move away from usability and move into another area. But don't make the mistake of instinctively thinking you've got to try to hit everything at five because it just rarely happens. Companies don't achieve their greatness and, and, and talent doesn't achieve its greatness by trying to be everything to everybody. So this is my second poll question for you. And this gets down to when we start thinking about those tough choices. You've probably heard, you know, there's jargon out there. And we, I've been talking about a promise. You've probably heard the idea of positioning before. And my question for you right now is, are they the same thing? Is a promise a positioning? Is a positioning a promise? Are they really just two words for the same thing? And I'll give you a second to think about it. Give me your answer. Um, these words, I feel like, are a lot like brand and that we sort of throw them around. Uh, and uh, they just start to, after a while, people even just use them interchangeably. Um, what I want to, uh, I'll give just one more moment. So I'm curious to see what the audience thinks. Bear with me. Well, I haven't got it yet, so we're going to keep moving. Oh, there we go. 42% uh, said that they are not the same thing. So uh, uh, you think that they are interchangeable. So we've got kind of a split. Uh, split uh, ticket here, and I, that's common. I think a lot of people that work in marketing all the time really do think they're interchangeable. I think after I just primed you now by talking about the importance of a promise, a lot of you are probably thinking, no, I don't think they are. And I'll tell you that 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 sort of go back and forth, it is, I even make the mistake myself. We'll be talking about something, we'll be talking about the promise, and then we'll say, what's the positioning? So it's an easy mistake to make, but they really are different concepts. Positioning is very much what we use to sell. It's the most important piece, whether you're running a political campaign or you're trying to do a winning marketing campaign, you need a positioning because I've got to put a piece of communication together and I want to figure out what's going to most convince you and persuade you to go with my brand. And so I'm going to make some claims and the positioning drives the claims. The promise is different. While they do overlap and there is some similarities, 
The promise is what's baked into the box, right? It is about the behavior. If I'm really living according to a promise, I'm using that as a filter for decision making. This is where they can overlap because you could say, okay, let's get let's keep people from in our organization from using positionings that don't align with our promise. You should always do that. But sometimes we have to have many different positionings because positioning is contextual. Different audiences are going to react in different ways, and so I may set up the sales pitch differently. The promise, however, will never change. It's about what I decide to do in those moments that matter. And so going back to my model of experiences over expectations, the promise is really driving the experience. It's really making sure that we are, we are delivering on the expectation that hopefully we set through our positioning. Where brands get in trouble is that they sometimes do these glitzy pushes through their marketing and advertising, their public relations, and they start saying a lot of things that they can't deliver on in the promise. And so that's where we get into that reputation problem. You set an expectation that right now you are not set up to deliver on. And that is, you may be able to get away with that once or twice, but over time, you're going to lose your audience. This is where credibility becomes so important. Uh, a big body of the research that I've done over the years is looking at what is this notion of credibility? Um, how do we measure it? And what really matters, and it's it's we've found it's universal. Whether I'm looking at talent, or whether I'm looking at a consumer products brand, or I'm looking at a, a tech company, the dimensions don't really vary. And it comes down to two key pieces: it's how much, first of all, do I trust you? Have you built trust over time? Do I do, at the better brands that have been around for a while, we start to have these just natural sense of what they can do for us. They don't even have to tell us. We we know it. We sense it. But it's also their expertise. Over time, you're going to establish yourself in different domains. Many brands expand that sense of expertise, their category fitness. If you think about Virgin, Virgin started off as a record store. It's now an airline. It has a financial services company in, the, in Europe. It is going into space. What has happened over time is that Richard Branson and his team have continued to establish themselves in more and more domains so that it's a really broad brand and has a broad range of expertise. That may be different than, say, Dollar Shave Club, which might have a much more narrow uh, range of expertise. Dollar Shave Club started off with razors and over time has gone to own the bathroom. But I don't know if right now we'd be willing to get on a Dollar Shave Club plane. Maybe we would. Maybe there's a day that comes for that. But these two bases of credibility are everything, the trustworthiness and the expertise. And trustworthiness is really the one that has the most power over all of it. And it mitigates the way that we think about the quality of a brand. It mitigates how much risk we're willing to take from the brand. And also how much we feel like the brand saves us time, those information costs. Um, now, the way to establish credibility uh, is the thing that is really important for you when you think about how you position yourself to the world. And the mistake that I see a lot of brands make is that they think they can reason their way in, right? I, the, the words that I hear played back is, if they just knew this about me, they buy 20% more. If they just knew, I had, back in the days of Kodak, um, I had a, a, a client at, at the Kodak organization tell me, you know, if people in Asia just knew how great that our film was, they would buy an extra roll and we'd improve our bottom line by 50%. Except it doesn't work that way. Most of the people they were talking about didn't have a camera, let alone the use for a better argument about why that film was better than Fuji or whichever competitor they were trying to position against. And this is normal because we think we can reason our way through. Psychology has told us we're definitely wrong on this. Um, this is Daniel Kahneman. Some of you probably read his work, a legendary Nobel Prize winning psychologist who in much of his research talked about that we have this human fallacy of thinking that we are thinking machines that happen to feel. And in reality, it's the opposite, right? We feel actually first in most cases, and then we reason and we think about based on what we're sensing. And this is important about brand experiences because that sexy part of the brand, many of you said name and logo being so important, that's getting at sensory experiences, it's how we get to know it. Sometimes it's not as sexy as a name or a logo. It may just be an interaction we have on, a, on the phone talking to a customer service representative for a brand or the way that we navigate through a website or the way that we get into a package when it arrives at our door. These things can be very emotionally powerful and in many ways can dictate what we think about a brand and how we think about it in terms of its credibility. So I was just talking to you earlier about this idea, experiences over expectations. I'm going to go right on and say it. As a strategist, which, which uh, expectations is what I work on the most, experiences trump them. They're really important because it doesn't matter. I can give the best strategy. I can write a piece that will have you carrying me out of the room on your shoulders because just I, I, I moved you with my words. But if we don't deliver on the experience, anyone who's had high school math or grade school math will tell you we got nothing, right? A zero on the numerator negates the denominator. So we need to focus our attention thinking about those experiences. And the really great brands, that's what they do. Of course, you want to figure out what your game plan is, what your strategy is, where you want to go. If you're a, as an online creator, you may be thinking, 
big long term. Like today I have the series that I'm producing, but five years from now, I hope I'm making motion pictures and I'm going to maybe set up my own uh, retail stores. That's all great. But you've got to start first from the building blocks of building one great experience after another and, and expand as with the experiences as they mature. Uh, I mentioned Dollar Shave Club uh, again. One of the things I really admired about that brand when they first launched, and I wrote a lot about it, was they waited until they nailed the first thing. They got the razor delivery for, down well. People were talking about it. Then they test marketed and started moving into ancillary products. They were quick to admit when they made a mistake and add, did it with humor so that you gave you forgave them. And then they fixed it before they moved on and just got into more and more um, channels to work with that consumer and increase the amount that was going into the box and that subscription value. So it's the experience that really, really matters. And when we think about it, it brand experience in particular are all about the sensations and the feelings and the thoughts that we have. We often say think, feel, do as a result of being exposed to the brand. I told you a moment ago, you know, we see people that sometimes just when they hear a brand's name or they see its logo, it evokes emotions. It gets them passionate about something where they weren't, where they were at a steady state, they weren't thinking about it. So we know that it can have that visceral experience. And this is where you have the most opportunity to really connect and build uh, engagement and loyalty and all the things that brands strive for and the reason why we do it. Where we get into trouble is that they're often at a disconnect. So this slide was, is in pur purposely uh, intended to provoke because the words are completely contradictory to what the symbols are putting in front of us. And this is sometimes when we do rebrands, the area where we're focusing a lot of our attention because the brand has all these great intentions and it wants to create these great experiences, but the way that the experience is designed isn't is counter to what they're talking about. So you're thinking through each of these things and seeing, are you staying on, on topic? Are you staying uh, true to that expectation that your consumer has? And remember, this works over time. So we know in terms of cognitive science, we learn first in a sensory way. We see something, we hear something, we taste it, we touch it, we feel it. We have these feelings about it that tells our brain to wake up. And then if it's powerful enough and it's or it's been experienced enough over time, it starts to lodge in our short-term memory and then eventually it, it gets engaged in our long-term memory. And we just know what to expect from an Apple or a Nike or a Starbucks because we've had these repeated experiences with them that moved us through our senses and then embedded into our long-term thinking. Now, this is the part where we start getting into, I think, the most fun when we think about the world where the, a lot of you live, which is when we think about the role of content and, and how brands get beyond just the function and start to really resonate and connect with people. You're all probably on social media. We're all familiar with likes. Um, but the really great brands are not so much built on the likes, but aligning like minds. This sense of it's not just inventory control, like I showed you with the cattle ranch. It's now a sense of we're connected. There's so, there's a, this sort of invisible telepathy that connects us because we share something and we, ha we have like minds. Um, I always say liking a brand is not the same as feeling a brand is like you. And that whether that brand is a, a, a celebrity or that brand is um, a, a, an airline that you like, we're still playing with the same kind of alignment and understanding whether or not there's a connection. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, advertising campaigns that Harley Davidson did about 10 years ago. Um, and one of the, this went into a magazine. I don't, they claim this came out of statistics that they pulled. I have no way of validating whether or not it's true. But according to this ad, uh, the number one tattoo was mom and the number two tattoo was Harley Davidson. But I love this image because this, this gentleman who has tattooed this on his neck is clearly done more than just liking the Harley Davidson brand. He's feeling committed enough to his relationship with the brand that he's willing to project it to the world. And he's, he's literally connecting it to himself. And that's what we're striving for. Maybe we're, we're not going to get people to tattoo our names onto their, uh, onto their bodies. We may not even want that. But we want that same sense of feeling of, of pride that people get wheel that they've aligned with this brand. And it's somehow it's saying something about them. Putting that on there really starts to also evoke what you stand for. Um, this study that YNR has repeated numerous times asked the question uh, about what consumers feel is important to them from brands. And we keep seeing, this is 71% back uh, in 2010, that, that people are making a point to buy brands from companies whose values are similar to their own. And that's only gone up over time. And the younger the audience, the higher the statistic. When you get into uh, consumers that are 18 to 25 years old, that's something we're seeing right now, that number is in the 80s, maybe inching its way up into the 90%. Because if there is more accountability in saying, I like this brand, but if this brand isn't behaving the way that I expect from it, then I don't want to do business with it. I can find someone else. And we live in a world where there's enough brands out there that if you don't like a brand, it's pretty easy to find another one that you can try on for size. 
Um, a big part of my research has been looking at how do we feel that connection? And uh, in my work at USC and, and collaboration with some of my colleagues, notably uh, Debbie McGinnis and C.W. Park, um, we've really looked at this notion of attachment. And as some of you have seen these brand pyramids. We talk about awareness, familiarity. We talk about your affinity, how much you have positive sentiments or you like a brand or not. Preference. You know, the interesting thing about preference, a lot of people, that's their sole focus in that moment of, of, of truth. Which brand do you choose? That's your preference. But some preference choices like that are actually habit. It's just easier not to make a new choice, a new preference. I've, I've always bought this brand. There's no reason not to get another brand. It takes too much time to go searching for other brands. So the funny thing about preference is if you come up with something that's truly groundbreaking, it can be easy to knock the, the existing category brand off its pedestal and change preference. But attachment gets into a different place because now it's like having a family member or a friend or a part of yourself. You feel this connection to the brand that goes beyond preference. It's not now starting to be this strong alignment. And in the research that we've conducted over the years, we, we even did an index where we would take 25 brands and every year we'd look at their attachment scores to see how they move over time. And what we found is that there's sort of these two dimensions. There's a sense of our brand self-connection that we are very much alike. Uh, when I do this for celebrities, a lot of times I'm looking at how much people feel that the celebrity feels that the, the, they would understand them, um, that they would respect them, not the, the respect that they have for the celebrity, but that if they met that celebrity, that celebrity would respect them. So they get into this alignment where the attached brand feels like there's a lot, this person's a lot like me versus brand aversion where you're like, that is the opposite of me. Um, and then in the lower quadrants, we start talking about lower levels of prominence, which means it's harder for you to think about the brand. That's where we start getting into brands that you either just get ignored or I respect you, but I, ha I have to think too hard about it. And it's not something that I have that same sort of reaction. So this attachment piece is an important one. And I tell clients all the time, focus on that, especially if you're in a consumer, you're a consumer brand and you're going to these very competitive marketplaces, uh, you want to build attachment. It, it works for B2B brands too, by the way, but in a different way, it's often in a professional dimension. It's often connected to employees. It's often, con often connected to client values. We don't have time to talk about that today. But in, when we talk about consumer branding, we see a lot of brands where this is evident, where people really feel a strong sense of attachment. Obviously, Disney has been one of those over the years. One of the ones that's come up in my research recently, which surprised me, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised, is Netflix, which has developed higher and higher levels of attachment over the years. And some of that is the, the uh, insecurity people have in feeling about that brand going away. They don't like to think about it. But some of it is through the programming and the content, Netflix has become a part of people's lives and they really see it as something that reflects them. Um, and, and, and some of that may come from the recommendation engine and helping them find the next program that they want to watch. I want to share one example. This is from some work that we did a few years ago in the studio uh, that we're really proud of. And it was a very collaborative effort with Mattel uh, where they brought me in and my team to talk about Barbie. And the challenge with Barbie is it's the flagship brand of Mattel. Um, there would be no Mattel without it. Um, and it's just, she's so iconic and has had such a legacy. But there was a moment in time, especially as millennial moms, uh, as we started having millennials having children, where there was a little bit of a rejection to Barbie. There was some, uh, some really, some challenging times for Barbie. And the way that the brand had been in their own internal work thinking about it is they kept talking, when I first sat with them, they talk a lot about Barbie being a dress rehearsal for girls, right? They, uh, one, the, the phrase I think was dress rehearsal for her life. And when we talked to moms and floated that concept, they did not like that idea at all. Um, it did not, it, mainly because they looked at the body image issues. They looked at the fact that Barbie was so cookie cutter. And, and in focus groups, we'd hear 10 to 15 minutes of just railing on Barbie. But it was really interesting in those focus groups, you know, because while they would talk about their perceptions of her being vapid and the sort of the wrong imagery and they don't want their daughters to grow up like Barbie, after that 15 minute period, these moms then started talking about their experiences with the brand when they were little girls. And the room changed and the sentiments and the th I, I remember there was one participant who said her first kiss was with Ken, you know, and so that was sort of the jumping off point, the in, the <clears throat> the insight that led us to, first of all, what the brand was about from its very beginning when Ruth Handler created it, which was this idea of imaginative play. It wasn't about Barbie. Barbie actually has no predefined story. Barbie's story can be whatever you want it to be. And she in invented the doll so that she noticed the girls were taking paper dolls and were projecting themselves into the paper dolls into all these scenarios they might want to experience when they grew up. And Barbie became a better substitute for that. And that's where the brand had to get back to find its magic. It had to win mom's confidence back by being that sort of device that helps girls imagine and helps them under, think better about themselves. Now, 
one of the, the opportunities we thought was not so much about dress rehearsal. This is dreamy. This is thinking about the life you could have or that you might want to try on for a little while because you're still, you're young and you've got a long time to go before you have to make these decisions. This is a way for you to have fun with it. There were some issues with that though. I mean, when you looked at the, even when we talk about if you can dream it, you can be it, we're still looking at the classic silhouette of Barbie. And fortunately for us, Mattel at that moment in time was also thinking about changing the sculpt of the doll to be more inclusive. And we thoroughly encouraged that. Um, we saw this as an opportunity for them to do something that was groundbreaking at the time. It was to reimagine the whole notion of what Barbie looks like and having different body shapes and sizes and skin tones to really make it more inclusive and to make girls be able to see themselves in the doll as well as you know whatever, wh whatever they see in the media and what, what they see others do with the doll. And what I'm most proud of in this project is we started it uh, two years before the program uh, launched. And that means we, my team goes away and we hope and pray that the client in that time doesn't, doesn't lose their confidence. They don't move on to another strategy. In this case, it was a wonderful collaboration because I'm so proud of how they took that and how they uh, narrowed, uh, put together a story around that to communicate what Barbie really needs to mean. And what we'll do right now is, is roll the film for you and how they, how they rolled that out. and I'll be your professor today. And I will be talking about the brain. Hi. Hello, I'm your veterinarian today. You're kidding. Nope, I'm Dr. Brooklyn, see? Okay, doctor. Oh, here, let me see. Good morning, everyone. I'm your new coach. My name is Maddie, nice to meet you. I had the most fantastic day in the office. You'll never believe what happened. We got that new business I wanted. Have you ever seen him fly? Have you seen him what? Fly? No. My cat can fly. Okay. The dog's brain can't think as much as the human's brain because there's no high school for the dog. <laughs> this is Peter, the Triceratops. Peter is one years old. The T-Rex, Sally, is 1,002,252 years old. <laughs> Knees up like a unicorn. Higher, higher. I've been to New York, Transylvania, Pennsylvania. We can think and do lots of stuff with our brain. Now, does anybody know how big the brain is? Anybody? Sophia. It is medium. Medium. Very good. So that short film uh, was created by BBDO in, uh, in collaboration with the client team. It was just done, I think they did such a beautiful job and it expressed exactly what we were hoping to, to uh, establish with moms and with daughters too, because obviously you want the girls to play with it, um, but you also want moms to feel confident in playing with it. Uh, for her to have that in her life. And I think they did a nice job in how they've told that story. And, and now it's, it, we'll wait to see as, 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 the, as the brand continues. Barbie's still going strong. She just had, I think, one of her best quarters in 10 years. Uh, so it seems to be having um, a great effect. But I'm gonna shift gears here as we wind down and just talk about, you know, we've talked a lot about how brands try to make that level of attachment. For corporate brands, a lot of that is in trying to make the brand feel more human. But what happens when we start thinking about humans as brands, right? There's a there's an interesting change here. Your humans are very different. It's harder to plan their lives. It's harder that, that you, you, they're, they're human. They're going to make mistakes. And so how do we think about brands in that case? How do we build apply these principles? I'll show you one quick video that will give you a little bit of an insight into sort of what I see uh, in my life, uh, in the work that I do at UTA, but I think it's a good jumping off point in terms of how we think about branding for, for human brands. You're not just an actor, Vince. You're not just a movie star. You, sir, are a brand. Mercedes. Coca-Cola. Two of the most recognizable names on the planet. Vincent Chase. We intend to make you as popular as both of them. All right, so for those of you who aren't Entourage fans and maybe didn't see that uh, story arc, the, the, the background on it is Vincent Chase 
has decided it's time to maybe shop for another agency. He's not sure he wants to stay with his uh, the agent who discovered him, Ari Gold. And so he goes around to all of the agencies and they give basically the same pitch, the same pitch of we, we see you as more than a celebrity or movie star, you're a brand. And obviously I've been in pitches and seen that same similar construct. But here's the thing that's interesting to me. We spend so much, brands spend so much time trying to convince consumers that they are human. Why would we ever want a human to try to present, to convince people that they're something that's inhuman, that it's like a Mercedes or a Starbucks, right? That's a, a, a little bit of odd thinking. And so what we've been developing over the last several years in the way that we advise clients is we, we've been calling it the star power model. And we've looked at, we ask uh, consumers up to 40 questions in this survey that we do where we're focusing on a particular talent. And it's interesting, regardless of whether they're in unscripted television, whether they're a, a Hollywood movie star, whether they're a musician or whether they're a journalist, we've seen the same fat patterns that statistically break out when we go through factor analysis into four different categories. And they were what they work out to, first of all, is admiration. How much people respect the accomplishments of that individual, the fact that they have talent or that they're really, they're really skilled in, in an area that that person recognizes as either similar to their own or something they, they aspire to. Credibility, which we already talked about, the trustworthiness, the integrity of the talent, their sense of authenticity, the fact that I know so much about them. If I'm going to go see an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, it's not much of a risk for me because I know exactly what Arnold's going to deliver in that movie, right? That sometimes is another piece of it. Um, the time savings it gets of just of, of being familiar with them. Then, of course, there's the glamour quotient. And it's really interesting. These always cluster together. Attractiveness, the sense of excitement you get from a celebrity, their aura, you might call it, their fame, how wealthy they are, what social circles they keep. And then this area that we found really interesting that we call kinship, which is how much it's kind of like the, the, uh, the, the, from the uh, 2000 campaign, when we tied the, there was all the media attention to which candidate would you rather have a beer with? It's that sense of, are they approachable? Are they empathetic? Do they, can you relate to them? Do you sense you share their values? Here's the part that I want you to take away from on this. All four of these statistically can drive the level of influence that a celebrity have. And we've actually shown you can use these levers to be more impactful when you're doing endorsements or when you're trying to sell something. But kinship, again and again, is always more than twice as powerful than the other three drivers individually. So it's very interesting. The more people feel an alignment of that attachment with a celebrity where there's we, we come from similar worlds or I could be him or she, he could be me or I feel like we'd get to know each other and we'd be friends and we'd go to parties or just the actions that that celebrity is making align so much with things that are important to me that I, I, I'm willing to go with them more than I would others. It doesn't matter how famous they are. So keep that in mind as you build your careers or even if you're on the brand side and you're aligning with influencers, this is an important one. It's great that they've got a huge platform, but it's also how much do their audiences feel that sense of kinship. And I'll leave you with this. The great branding that we've been talking about today makes companies more human. It makes humans more akin. That's, that's really what it's about. Um, but the way to do that and just to simplify it is that great brands are like us, right? We, we start to think about them. There's Susan Fournier uh, has written so much brilliant uh, research on the fact that we, we, whether we try to or not, whether we reject the notion or not, we just, without much effort, put human qualities onto brand. And the more that you can make those brands feel like they're a human that belongs in your life or that you're a human that belongs in that brand's life, the more success that you're going to have. Um, I've talked, I've gone a little bit over time, but I want to make sure that we had get questions. So we'll stop um, before I open it up to the floor. If you're if you're interested in this, uh, this these are some other places you can go uh, to to see some of the other research that I've done and some of the other works that I've written about branding. And now I'll stop talking for a moment and take questions.